It's my pleasure now to introduce our second half of our program today. Uh, Marie Knecht is going to be talking to us about uh, Oscar Schindler, Thomas Keneally, and my parents' Holocaust legacy. Uh, Marie is the daughter, as it says, of um, Leopold and Ludmilla Pfefferberg Page. Her father is the person who met author Thomas Keneally in their handbag store in Beverly Hills in 1980 and said, I have a story for you. Her parents often told the story of how Oscar and Emily Schindler saved their lives during the Holocaust, which became the book and then the movie Schindler's List. Marie plays euphonium and percussion in the Los Angeles Symphonic Winds, and her husband, who's here, Jeffrey, plays clarinet. She is also a fitness professional teaching classes to active adults, including seniors. Uh, her goal this year and for the future is to tell her parents' story so future generations will never forget. And with that, Marie, thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait to hear the story. So good morning, everybody. My name is Marie Connect, and as you heard, I'm the daughter of Leopold and Ludmila Pfefferberg Page. And my father was the one who met uh, Thomas Keneally in our retail store in Beverly Hills in October of 1980. And but before I get into their story, I want to tell you a little bit about me. I graduated Santa Monica College with an Associate of Arts degree in child development, and my father asked me to come and work at the store and um, at the handbag store. And so I left everything and worked for him for 22 years. Uh, we sold the store and then we, we um, uh, became wholesale. We so started to sell handbags from Italy, these little square handbags with metal handles. You might remember some of those. And then we sold appliques um, for a clothing line and we called ourselves L Page Imports and the handbag wholesale company was called Borsabella. Um, I started playing with the Los Angeles Symphonic Winds in 1995 and concurrently um, still play with them, uh, euphonium, which is like a baby tuba, and um, percussion. And my husband, Jeffrey, uh, who's in the audience today, he also plays clarinet. Uh, my father, he had passed away in 2001, so I liquidated the business. And uh, Richard Simmons, um, a good friend of mine, inspired me to become a fitness professional. And for the last 20 years, I've been teaching at 24-Hour uh, Fitness, Hillcrest Country Club, um, two uh, senior um, living communities. And, um, and so then um, in 2020, um, um, yes, uh, my mother passed away in um, December of 2020 at 100. And um, in August 22, I was asked to speak um, in a presentation with the Sousa Mendez Foundation and um, to talk about my parents' story. And it was the first time I ever did that. And um, my band director, Steve Piazza, saw me give the presentation and asked that I come and speak at two concerts uh, last year. And that's how I met Bill Green. And that's why I'm here today. So going back to, oh, I'm sorry about that. Going back to October of 1980, um, and I'm going to show you here. Um, this is our handbag studio at um, 149 South Beverly Drive. And a gentleman came into our store looking for a repair on his um, briefcase. And my brother Fred was helping him um, in the beginning and then introduced him to um, Thomas Keneally. And Thomas Keneally was looking for um, a repair on his um, briefcase. And so my brother introduced him to my father, and my father eventually sold him a brand new briefcase. And while they were waiting for the credit card to be approved, uh, my father asked Mr. Keneally where he was from and what he did for a living. And he said that he was, um, this is my father, um, he said that he was uh, from Australia and he was a writer. And he was at Brentano's in Beverly Hills signing his book. And so my father told Mr. Kennelly, I have the greatest story I tell everyone about humanity, about a Nazi German who risked his life during the Holocaust to save myself, my wife, 
and 1,300 other men and women and children during the Holocaust. My father took um, Mr. Keneally to the back office and introduced him to my mother who was working that day and um, showed him many documents um, um, about Oscar Schindler and many testimonies from the Schindler Jews. And so Mr. Keneally looked at the papers and he said to my father, um, I don't think I can write a story about the Holocaust. And my father said, give me three good reasons why you can't write this story. And he said, well, I'm too young, I'm not Jewish, and I'm studying to become a priest. <laughs> and my father said, those are the three best reasons why you should write this book. Don't worry, we'll travel to Europe and to Israel and the United States and interview the Schindler Jews and you'll have your story. And that's what they did. All right. So I'd like to go back to the very beginning. Um, my father was born uh, as Leopold Feverberg, and he lived in Krakow, Poland with his father David, his mother Mina, and his sister Pauline. Um, in the picture here, um, his mother is in the far right um, corner, his sister Pauline, and of course my dad. I don't have a picture of his father. My father graduated um, high school, and then he went on to the University of Krakow, and he got a master's degree in uh, physical education and philosophy. Uh, my father played many sports with the Maccabi Sports Club. He was part of the Polish national uh, snow ski team. Um, in 1935, he joined the Polish army and graduated at the top of his class. And so here's a picture of my father in his um, uniform. And though when the war broke out in September of 1939, in November, my father was called to the front um, to fight the Germans. And sadly, his uh, captain was um, killed, and many of the officers were killed. And my father was wounded in the leg and helped another uh, officer to a nearby hospital. Um, and my father told the doctors there that he was a physical education teacher. And, um, and so the doctors gave him a special note where he can leave the hospital and go out and get um, more soldiers to bring them back to the hospital. Eventually the Germans came and took over the town and the hospital and the officers were giving a, a choice to whether to go to a, a prison in the Soviet Union or a prison in Germany. And so my father picked the, the prison in Germany because of the Geneva Convention, think he would be better treated off better treated there in Germany. So on the train to Germany, the train stopped in my father's hometown. And my father was very smart. He was thinking, mm, I have a note here that says I can get off this train. So he showed the note to the guard. And he said, look, this note says I can leave. And so the, the guard looks at the note. He says, OK, go ahead and go. <laughs> so my father walks away from the train. And once he's out of sight, he hops on a trolley and goes home. But he couldn't stay at home, he stayed with friends. So now I'm gonna go on to my mom. My mom was born as Ludmila Levinson, and she was born in Kishinev, Romania. And at one year old, she moved with her father, Siegfried, and her mother, Maria, to Loch, Poland. Uh, her mother, uh, Maria, was a doctor of um, dermatology. She's on the far, far right corner. And her, and her father, Siegfried, he was a, a surgeon. And her mother, uh, Sofia Yosef, that's her grandmother in the far right corner, and that's my mom on the left. And so my mother also um, graduated high school. In 1934, her father passed away. And uh, when my mother was just starting uh, the University of Vienna to study medicine, that's when the war broke out. And she told me that she was in a cafe in, the, in Vienna with a friend. And the Germans marched through the town, and the people that lived there were throwing flowers at the Germans' feet. And so my mom knew that she had to leave, and she took a regular train back home. There was a knock on the door, and um, there were two German officers that came to the door, and they said that her mother was being deported to Krakow. And so, and to leave all your valuables on the kitchen table. And my mom told me that her mom gave her a little bundle, possibly jewelry, and to throw it down the toilet. And so that she listened to her mom. And they took a regular train um, to Krakow. And once they were there, they were registering. And a gentleman came up to them and said, do you have a place to stay? 
And they said, no, they were very upset. And he said, don't worry, I'll take you to my home and we'll find you a place to stay. So they, the gentleman picked him up with a, a, a horse and a buggy, they call it a droshka, and took him to, the, to his home and introduced him to Professor Leopold Pfefferberg. And of course, my mother fell in love with him and they got married. All right, so then my father was uh, visiting his mom one day and uh, there was a knock on the door and um, his mother looked through the people and she got really upset and she said, Polly, that's just, my father had a lot of nicknames. Polly, there's, there's a Nazi, a German at the front door. He's wearing a swastika on his lapel. And my father being an escaped prisoner of war, he went to the kitchen and took out um, his pistol and he hid behind the kitchen door. And he said, go ahead and open up the door and see what he wants. The gentleman introduced himself as Oscar Schindler. He was looking for the expertise of Mina Pfefferberg to do interior decorating on his home that, that he just purchased in Krakow. So everybody worked for him, my mother and Pauline, my father's um, um, sister and Mina, they were all doing like drapes and dining room, you know, tablecloths, things like that. So um, my father came out from the kitchen before that, and um, introduced himself to Oscar Schindler. And Oscar was interested in the silk shirts that my father was wearing. And my father said to Oscar, I can get you anything you want on the black market. And that's how their friendship began. And my father helped him with all kinds of things, um, you know, with black market things. And they became friends until Oscar died in 1974. So going back to the story, um, there was a, a German order from the Germans saying that all Jews have to leave their apartments, their homes, and move into a 16-block ghetto in the center of Krakow. Uh, you had to be an essential worker to be in the ghetto, and my father tried to get documents for my mother and his parents, his sister and her husband, Edward, and my mother's mother. But he was only able to get documents for himself and my mom. So later... Um, his parents, his sister, husband, and my mother's mother went to Sarno, Poland. And my father later heard that um, his parents were killed in a concentration camp. His sister and husband went to Warsaw, Pol Poland, and were living on false Iranian papers and were denounced and sent to a Polish prison and uh, were shot. My mother's mother went to Warsaw, then to Tarno, Poland, where she was working in a hospital. And she, the Germans came and took over that town and killed everybody in that hospital. My mother was able to get a job working for Julius Modric. Julius Modric had a textile company, and he had it inside the ghetto, and she was sewing uniforms uh, from the front. My father had a special note saying that he can leave the ghetto, and once he'd leave the ghetto, he would remove his Jewish armband, hop on a bicycle, and do black market for Oscar Schindler. Now, Oscar Schindler, he had uh, an enamelware factory called Deutsche Enamelware Fabrik, and they called it Amalia for short. And he had hired a lot of the Jews from the ghetto to work there, and they were making pots and pans for the war effort. There was another or order from the German officials saying that the ghetto was going to be um, liquidated. And my father tried to find an escape route to the sewers, and he told my mom to wait in the apartment. So he went to look for an escape route uh, through the sewers, but the Germans found out that the people were trying to escape. So my, on my, the way back to the apartment, my father heard a lot of commotion, dogs barking, and people coming. So he started moving the bundles, the suitcases that people left in the streets off to the side of the road. And when the German official approached him, he said, what are you doing? And my father stood up with an attention and saluted to him. And he said, well, I was ordered to move the bundles out of the, out of the walkway so there'll be a clear passage so you can travel through. And they kind of just left laughed at him, and they just went on their merry way. And once they were out of sight, my father walked back slowly 
to the apartment. And then my mother wasn't there, so he asked her around, where's Mila? Now my mother had a lot of different nicknames too. And so where's Mila? And someone said that she went with one of the last groups to uh, Plashov labor camp. So my father decided to join one of the last groups as well and go to Plashov labor camp. So here's a picture of Plashov that my father drew. I found that in his papers. And it's just a description of the, of the camp. And here's another one. Now the Plashov was built on two Jewish cemeteries. The Germans tore down all the tombstones and, and they made a road into the entrance of Plashov. You also had to be an essential worker to be in Plashov. And so Ma Modric, he happened to move his sewing factory inside the camp so his workers can continue to have a job. Now my father, on the other hand, he only had a degree that he teaches physical education. And of course, they didn't need a physical education teacher in Plashov. And they were going to send him to Auschwitz. And my father said, look, I'm young. My hands are good. I can be a welder in the camp garage or a metal pot polisher. So they put him to work in the garage as a welder. And now my father didn't know how to do any welding. But there was a Jew that helped him and taught him how to be a welder. And that's what he did. And being a welder, he was allowed to walk freely in the camp. This person here is um, Amon Gut. He was the commandant of Plashev. He was a monster, a terrible person. He would stand on his balcony with that rifle, and he would shoot at the prisoners below. He would shoot at prisoners if they weren't walking fast enough, if they were not working good enough, or just for the joy of killing. He also had two, <coughs> excuse me, Dalmatians. <coughs> and he would say go kill, and those dogs would kill the prisoners as well. Now, Oskar Schindler, all his workers are now in Plashev, so he became friends with Amon Get. He bribed him with uh, gifts and, and alcohol and lavish parties to win his friendship to get his workers to come back to Amalia, and so he was granted that wish. And so um, Oskar Schindler also built barracks in his factory so the workers wouldn't have to go back to Plashev every day. People were saying if you worked in Schindler's factory, it was like a haven. Nobody was ever killed, nobody was ever beaten. There was some food, there was some clothes, and of course they worked. Um, so were they making pots and pans for the war effort? All right, so my mother, let's see what's the next one, okay. So um, my mother was working in Modric one day and she heard from a fellow worker saying that um, the Soviet army was approaching and they were going to liquidate Plasha. They were going to send all the Jews to Auschwitz. And that Oskar Schindler was making a list of all his workers to take him to Brynlitz, Czechoslovakia. So on the list, there were 800 men on this particular list. And my father was 173 on the list. And on the women's list, there was 300 and she was 195 on the list. Now there's another story that I'm just finding out from reading different testimonies from the Schindler Jews that Julius Modric, Oscar Schindler asked Julius Modric to join him in Brynlitz, but he didn't want to. And Oscar Schindler asked him to make a list of his workers and he would add them to an additional list. So there were 60 men and 20 women on that list, and so that was an additional list to the Schindler's list. So there were two trains. The first train uh, went to um, Gross Rosen, and that had eight, the 800 men on it. So there, I'm sure there was a couple of trains. And here's a picture of Gross Rosen on the left, and a picture of Auschwitz, and that's Thomas Keneally when he went on that tour with my father th through Europe. So there was a train to Gross Rosen with the men. And they were there for three days. And my father told me that the men had to stand in the center of the, the, of the camp. They had to remove all their clothes. For hours, the Germans took their sweet time to um, take roll call. This is the, in the middle of dead winter, freezing cold. And then the men were sent to barracks. And they had to sit like dominoes, like with their legs wide open for three days. And once they finally got to Brynlitz, they asked... Oskar Schindler, where is the women? And at first, he didn't know where they were. And my mom told me that their group of 300 women went to Auschwitz-Birkenau for three whole, horrible weeks. 
She told me when she got off the train, she saw that the sky was red, and it looked like it was raining, but it wasn't rain, it was ash. There were dogs barking, Germans screaming at them, and their group went to the building on the left. They had to remove all of their clothes, the hair got cut very short, and they were put in this room with these metal nozzles coming down from the ceiling, and the women didn't know what to expect. And finally, water came out of those nozzles, and they knew that that day they were not going to die. When my mother and the other women left that building, they noticed a whole other group of men, women, and children going to the building on the right, and that's where the chimneys were. Oscar Schindler finally found out the women were in Auschwitz-Birkenau, and he sent someone to bribe the commandant there um, with diamonds and money to have his 300 women released. And he was granted that wish. And once the women came to Brinlitz, Oscar Schindler was waiting for them at the train station. And he said, don't worry now, you're safe, you're with me. There's hot food, hot soup and bread on the factory floor. In this uh, factory, they did not make pots and pans. They were making fake artillery bullets. Nothing real went out of this factory. I want to go on to a different story in a few minutes. This is Emily Schindler. Emily Schindler wasn't really much in the picture in Krakow. Oscar Schindler was a womanizer, and he had many girlfriends. But in Brindlitz, she came to help him with the Schindler Jews. There was uh, two trains that came in to Brinlitz, and nobody, no other camp wanted them. And there were people on that train. And um, Mr. Schindler asked Oscar Schindler, he was away from the factory that day, can I bring those people into the factory? And he said yes. But the doors were frozen, completely shut on the train. So she asked my father and another gentleman to bring their welding torches to open up that train door. And in that train had 126 people on that train, and 16 died of being frozen to death. Mr. Schindler b purchased a plot in Bruno, Czechoslovakia, next to a Catholic church, and he had Rabbi Levertov, who was a Schindler survivor, give the prayer for the dead. And the other people that were survived, Mr. Schindler had to help them eat. They forgot how to eat, they were so skinny. And so she brought them back to better health. On the, leave of, on the eve of liberation, Mr. Schindler brought all the Schindler Jews to the factory floor and gave a beautiful speech. He gave each one of those survivors a roll of fabric so they can start their lives over again. Um, the Schindler Jews also gave Mr. Schindler a note signed by all of them, thanking him for saving their lives and for and just in case he was stopped by the Soviet army or the Americans, letting them know that he did what he did by saving 1,300 men and women children during the Holocaust. The Jews also, uh, one of the Schindler Jews gave up two gold crowns and they made a mold and a gold ring. And the description in Hebrew said, whomever saves one life saves the world entire by the Talmud. So um, going on. So my parents stayed in Brinlitz for about, um, I guess about two months, just to get their strength back. And then they went on to Budapest, and they ran into a friend named Arthur Rand. And they stayed there for a couple of weeks or so, and then they traveled on to Munich, to the American Zone. And that's where my mother and father met up with Oskar Schindler and some friends from the camps. And here's a picture of my mom in the white blouse and Oskar Schindler and their friends. My father got a job at the United Nations Re Relief and Re uh, Rehabilitation Administration, and his job was to get children back in the schools, and he got 1,700 children back in the school. Now, Arthur ran his friend, went to New York early, and then finally my parents got their papers to go to New York, the United States. And while you're waiting in line to register, someone said, you know, you might want to think about changing your name. People are going to misspell it. And so my father told me that he went to a, a telephone booth, and he picked up the yellow pages, and he picked the word page, P-A-G-E. So now they're Leopold and Ludmila Page. 
So Arthur learned how to repair handbags from somebody, and my father really wanted to teach physical education, but he didn't know the language. And so they opened up a handbag store uh, repair shop in lower Manhattan called Rand and Page. My mother got a job working in a department store picking up um, clothes from the floor. Now Arthur left New York, I think it was 1948, and then uh, he kept calling my parents every day, Paul, Mila, you have to come to Los Angeles because in the morning you can snow ski in the San Bernardino Mountains in the morning, and in the afternoon you can go to the beach and swim. And the winters were so cold in New York, I, uh, my father has decided, okay, let's go to Los Angeles. So in 1950, he came to Los Angeles, and Arthur said, let's open up another handbag, st sure, uh, handbag shop. And he said, no, I want to open up my own handbag repair shop in the city of Beverly Hills, because that's where the writers and the producers are, and I want to tell the story how Oscar Schindler saved our lives and 13 other men, women, and children during the Holocaust. I want to make his name a household name. So in 1952, my father and my mother and 11 other people founded the 1939 Club, which is now called the 1939 Society. And it was a place for Polish Holocaust survivors or any Holocaust survivor to come and meet and have a party and educate everyone about the Holocaust so no one would ever forget. My father also was a Boy Scout leader and a commissioner and was honored by the city of Los Angeles. Going um, forward, okay, so in, um, my father did meet a, um, a producer from one of his customers from MGM, uh, Martin Gosh, this is not Martin Gosh, and um, he, uh, MGM was gonna do this Oscar Schindler story and Howard Koch was, did a screenplay, but nothing ever happened with it. It just kind of went dead. So um, my father went to Paris and met up with Oscar Schindler. And here's a great picture of my father and Oscar Schindler. And um, he, Oscar Schindler came to um, Los Angeles. And here we are at the Los Angeles International Airport. And my mother is holding the flowers, and Oscar Schindler is with a red tie, and my father on his, on his right. And the far bottom is Lola Krumholtz, who is a, a Schindler survivor, and her son, Stephen, whom I'm very good friends with now. And Lo, uh, Tosha Lieberman, all I remember from Tosha, she would come with us on vacation, and I would call her teacher. She would always give us some kind of schoolwork to do on vacations. And in the back there is Leon Lison, and he was one of the youngest um, Schindler Jews, his wife Liz, and his brother David, and there I am at 12 years old in red. And I think my brother Fred was taking the picture. <laughs> All right, and here's another picture of my mom and Oscar Schindler. At, we had two stores on South Beverly Drive. The, this particular store was at 191 South Beverly Drive, and that's with Oscar Schindler and my mom. Okay, so in 1982, uh, Thomas Keneally did write the book. It was called Schindler's Ark. And uh, Simon and Schuster decided to change the name to Schindler's List because maybe Noah's Ark, uh, he didn't want to confuse that. So he cha they changed the name to Schindler's List. It won the Booker Award Prize. And then Universal Pictures um, picked up the rights to do the movie. But Steven Spielberg wasn't quite ready to make that movie yet. He wanted, to be, he wanted to be in the right mind to make that movie. He wanted to give it justice. So it kind of laid dormant for 10 years. But my father kept calling um, Steven Spielberg's office, and possibly Steven, and would say, stop making movies about aliens and dinosaurs and make a movie that's going to win you an Oscar. My father always told Steven, an Oscar for an Oscar. <laughs> All right, so here's a picture of my father and Thomas Keneally and Steven Spielberg. This is in 1993. Uh, and here's a picture of Steven and my mother. All right, so the picture on the left is myself and my father and my brother Fred at our warehouse called Borsabella, where we were making those, uh, importing those bags from Italy, those little box bags with metal handles. And then here's a family picture. This is really an older picture from 1998. On the far left is my nep nephew, Matthew, Samantha, my sister-in-law, Judy, my brother, Fred. Uh, in the front is my mother, 
Ludmila, my father Leopold, myself with short brown hair, <laughs> and my husband Jeff, and the gentleman in the back is Alien Prudes. This was a special honor for my parents at the Beverly Hills Hotel. All right, so uh, my father did tell this story to the world, and this picture here is the backdrop of the Schindler's List poster and my father in the front. Now, my father was also on the committee um, for the United um, uh, Los Angeles Holocaust Museum, and he was on the committee that built those six um, beautiful structures, the black posts, honoring the six million Jews that had passed and who were murdered. Um, my father spoke um, with the 1939 club. He was part of the committee that did the uh, UCLA Holocaust chair, the first studies of the Holocaust. When I went to school, I never learned about the Holocaust except from my parents. Chapman University in Orange County with Marilyn Heron. She's in charge of the Holocaust studies with that university, and they have a library honoring Oscar Schindler. And when I did the presentation with the Susan Mendez Foundation. Um, David Crow, who wrote another book about Oscar Schindler, donated all his papers to Chapman's um, library there. My father's um, uh, army medals are there, and the copies of the Schindler's List are there, and many other items. Um, I have a gentleman in the audience, um, Robert Don, in the front here. And he, I just met him through the Jewish Heritage Museum. They had a presentation on Zoom with the Shoah Foundation. And um, he was at Temple uh, with his father um, in 1993, and the rabbi was talking about Schindler's List and Oscar Schindler, and his father leaned over and said to him, your mother was on that list. Sadly, his mother passed away in 1988 and never told him the story. And so now he's researching and doing a book about learning about his, what his mother was. And his mother was Rosa Laffer. She was 139 on Schindler's List. Um, we're meeting um, next Saturday um, with another lady, uh, Randy Biederman. She is the wife of Mark Biederman, and Mark's father was Hirsch Biederman, number three. So we're meeting for lunch. And uh, my goal also is to meet with the second generation of Schindler survivors so we can either meet on Zoom or in person. I want to keep that going. I think my father would, would be very proud of me getting that done. Um, I have um, four messages for my family. My father's message, in the darkest moments of your life, you, may, you must think positively that you'll overcome. You must have hope that you'll survive. The strength is in yourself. My mother's message, never be prejudiced against any group of people. Always believe in the goodness of human nature. My brother Fred's message is being a longtime Boy Scout. What I learned from that experience is to never forget. Be trustworthy, loyal, and kind. And what I learned from my parents was to be able to accomplish life goals, be kind and respectful to others, Always believe in myself and never give up. I want to thank you all for listening today to my parents' story. Thank you. All I have Question. to say is wow. Um, any comments, any questions for Marie? Yeah, hold on. Um, when the movie came out, after the movie came out, um, a friend of mine who lives in Encino, her mother was on Schindler's List. Wow. And, um, but her mother never told her any experiences that she had during the war, during when she was oh, she, Do you still in touch with her? Yeah, I know where she lives. I, yeah. Please um, get in touch with me, because I would lovely, love to hear their story. Okay. And, um, but after the movie, her mother did start talking to her daughters. Um, also, my mother who was not, her, gra her, her grandmother was perished in the Holocaust and a few of her uncles and aunts. But, um, she, so anyway, one of her, one of my mother's very good friends was um, a Hungarian Jew and was incarcerated in Auschwitz-Birkenau and never told her daughter 
what she experienced. She would confide in my mother, who would then confide in her daughters. And occasionally this woman, Terry Mermelstein, would confide in us too. And, but after Schindler's List, she then started talking to her own daughter. So I guess it made it acceptable and they didn't have to be ashamed or they didn't have to be fearful of revealing what they went through. I want to say one more thing that Steven Spielberg, after the movie, he, all the money that he got for the movie, he um, put together the Shoah Foundation at USC where they interviewed all the Holocaust survivors, including my parents. They're on YouTube, their stories. You can find a lot of the stories. Now, when I went to school, I didn't, of course, didn't learn about the Holocaust until after the movie. And many people never told their children about the Holocaust, including Robert here. His mother never told him about the story, and he would have never known that his mother was on Schindler's List if he wasn't at that Yom Kippur service, and his father just leaned over and said his mom was on the list. So many people came out when they wanted to and, and gave their testimonies. Any more questions? Let me, let me get back. I'm on a committee at my own synagogue, Valley Outreach Synagogue, and this is last February. We had a survivor from Schindler's List. Her name is Selena Karpinaj. Do you know her? She lives in Thousand Oaks. If you can, if you can get in touch with me, that would be great. I would like to, and I'd like to get because I'd like you to speak at our synagogue next year. I can't hear. I would like you to speak at our synagogue next year. For, oh, I'd love to. Yeah, I. I Thank you so much. Yeah, love Please. it. Yeah, so st stay afterwards. I'll get your information. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Don't trip on the wire. Yes, thank you for that. I've been trying to get a hold of her myself because the talk louder the, the Bob. book that I'm writing about her, the author that wrote the book that, about her story called Saved by Schindler. I've been trying to get a hold of him about my book and talk. Talk in the it. microphone. So, I can't hear oh, you. sorry, but yeah. But anyways, um, what I wanted to ask you that I've always been kind of intrigued about was your father instrumental after Schindler's List came out, because it was kind of, I've always never known, you know, what the story was behind how the Shoah Foundation got funded and, and, you know, really created. And I guess my question was, was your father instrumental in being involved with the Shoah Foundation and Spielberg to get the um, he, he Shoah Foundation started? He probably was, but I think it was mostly um, um, it Stephen. Was mostly he took the money that he received from the movie and put it into the USC Shoah Foundation. Now, if you, there was an article from the Hollywood Reporter uh, from February, February 21st. If you can find that on the web, I think it's still out there. Um, Steven Spielberg talks about um, Oscar Schindler and Schindler's List and how he was in the right mind, not, not ready to make the movie in 1982 and waited 10 years. And so he talks about it. Ralph Fiennes is in the article. Liam Neeson, who played Schindler's List, is in the article. It's a very good article. I would recommend anybody who would be interested to find out more information to also okay, to read you. that. I'm sure you spoke a little t about this, but I've been so curious, like, why would Rob's mother not have told him about being a Schindler? You know, a lot of people suffered quite a bit during the Holocaust. And it all depends on what, how they dealt with it. And um, my father always talked to my brother and myself about the Holocaust. They told us their stories. And, um, you know, and we listened. But when I was growing up, you know, this was my father's thing. And I was into music, and I was into horses. I even had my own horse, uh, Wendy. And, um, you know, I didn't start getting involved in this until really August of 22 when the Sousa Mendes S, uh, Foundation asked me to give this presentation. I had like 20 sticky notes of all the things that I said to you today because I memorized everything <laughs> and went over and over to remember everything. I even had notes today on, my, on here and I didn't look at them because I've been practicing to memorize my lecture and it's easier for me to look at you and tell my story. I was going to say, we, we actually had a speaker schedule. We may get him back. He is at USC. He's done a study on the children of the children from the Holocaust, um, psychological study, et cetera, et cetera, and has some interesting results. So uh, we're hoping to get him uh, back here to talk. He had to cancel because of an illness, but uh, we'll, we'll try again because we may get some of the insight into why, you know, and, and what 
even the, the next generation or two has experienced since their parents experienced in the Holocaust. Let's get the mic back here. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for everything. I appreciate yes, it. Yes, if you can speak a little louder. Okay. I was just wondering, this is sort of a philosophical question, but considering what you've been through. I, I can't understand you. I'm sorry. If you can talk okay. a little louder. Sorry. Considering what you've been through and your family's been through, considering what's going on in the world today, and I spend some time living in Israel, I just wanted to know if you could tell me what's your insight into the lessons or... I, I can't... What did she say? I'm sorry. I can't hear. Just one second. Hearing a Given time. what's going on in the world today, um, in, including in, at Isra in Israel, what's your insight into what? Your, your feelings about what's going on today in light of the experience that you Jews know have something? had. I think, um, I think the movie needs to come out again and people need to see it and, and learn from it. Um, it's real important that we not talk bad, bad about people and um, it's, it's sad that what's going on in Israel and Gaza and everywhere else um, they need to bring out the movie back. And so the younger generation, right now, the younger generation is not paying attention. My goal is to be able to speak in the schools to teach the kids about the Holocaust. You know, when I, I live right near the Stephen Weiss, uh, excuse me, uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center, and I see busloads of children going to that museum every single day, and even police officers going to that museum and learning about the Holocaust. It, it's important that people learn what happened so it will never happen again, and of course it, it already is. So it's important that we keep teaching. Reed, did you travel back to Poland, to um, you know, the concentration camps, to these sites, either on your own or with your dad? Yes. And what, were, what was your feelings and experiences, and how did he react seeing it all again? When I went with my parents, this was a long time ago, 1972, we went to Poland, and um, I saw where my father grew up, and I saw my mother's apartment. They actually let us go inside the apartment in my mother's place, and it was quite interesting. We went to Lodz, uh, Poland, and we saw my um, grandparents, um, my mother's mother and her father, and uh, we added, actually, her, her mother to a plaque on the, um, at, at the cemetery there. Then we went to Krakow, and I saw Auschwitz, and I was very moved by what I saw, thousands of shoes and, and soap and all kinds of, you know, they have a museum there now. Now also, also Oscar Schindler's factory in Krakow is now a museum as well. I gotta tell you something. Um, Daniel Beer, um, this is in Brindlitz. His, the Brindlitz factory was owned by Daniel Beer and um, his parents had a textile factory there and the Germans kicked them out. And that's how Oskar Schindler got that factory through the Germans. And um, so now Daniel Beer um, has, required, has gotten the factory back in his name. It was his grandfather's. And they're restoring it in 2025. They're supposed to reopen it as a museum to teach the Holocaust to people and tell them what happened. And uh, so I was very moved when I went with my parents. You know, when I was in Israel, oh, excuse me, when I was in Poland, I had a Jewish star because we just came back from Israel. My mom said, put your Jewish star under your shirt because they still had anti-Semitism there in Poland. And it's still happening. God, let's, we got to have peace in the world. Yes. You know, when I've been to um, Krakow, Auschwitz, I mean, I've been to Auschwitz, I've been to... Um, I've been to where my mother was. Actually, it was a very revealing moment for me. I just wanted to mention, I was standing there inside the Schindler factory, and I was with my wife, and the tour guide was just going on and on about what we were showing. And all of a sudden, there was this wall, and I didn't know Marie at the time, and I looked up, and I saw the list of people on there, and I couldn't find my mother's name. And all of a sudden, as the lecturer went on and on, there my mother's name was right on oh, that wow. wall you know, sitting there and it was just, it moved me, you know, and really kind of was the finalization to start writing this book. But what I wanted to ask you is, 
did your father, and this is what I was kind of getting at, when I visited all the places that I was at in the U.S. Holocaust Museum here in uh, Washington, I was always curious if survivors ever spoke about how complicit everybody was in joining Hitler in this massive undertaking to do what he did. I mean, I imagine there was, I mean, you know, at that time during World War II, it was prime for whatever happened. We had economic chaos going on. You know, people want, the Germans were humiliated during World War I, so it was easy pickings, I guess, for Hitler to rise up to power. They needed something to offer a solution. But it was one, one I guess my question was, you know, how complicit everybody was just to go along with this against these people and to use them as a scapegoat. I mean, this was massive throughout Europe. I don't know if he ever talked about that. No. I always thought that was fascinating. How many people were just so willing to go along with, the, with this process? <coughs> It's happening right now. I, I so was going to say, I mean, I, I hope it's not <coughs> going to, I mean, yeah, it's scary what's happening now. People aren't speaking up, just going along with the flow. People like power. Yeah. When, when I was at that um, event that was done at the Jewish Museum, and it was for Schindler descendants in New York, it was a talk in the microphone. And uh, Liam Neeson was there, and Steven Spielberg f spoke by video, thanking everybody for being there. There had to be about 300 people there. It's a beautiful museum in the lower part of Manhattan. But um, you know, I met a woman that was there, and she worked for a company called Bear Chemical, and Bear Chemical was the company, and she didn't know this when she went to work for them, but um, she told me she was there about three years, and Bayer Chemical was the company that was key in the development of Zyklon G, which was the, you know, um, fluid that went into the gas chambers and stuff like that. So when she found that out, um, she resigned immediately. So what I'm getting at is these massive people that knew what they were doing and just were compl complicit in the process, and, you know, it just always, totally amazed me that that happened. Yes, Jerry. Uh, just a, a sort of footnote to your comments about Steven Spielberg. Uh, we can look at history as events, but we can also look at history and remark that in so many cases, there is one person who who was at the right, who was the right person at the right time and, and uh, the right occasion. And I think that Steven Spielberg really doesn't get enough credit for what he did. Yes, uh, you commented on his financial generosity, but he also pulled strings and called up everybody that he knew in, in, um, uh, in, in the industry who had some special skills or abilities and said, yep. he, uh, our people say what we need is a system that will do such and such for recovery of these cassettes uh, of testimony, et cetera. And everything, there, there was no store that sold any of that. All of it was engineered for him very often without charge, but certainly a priority that you or I or anybody else couldn't get. So he, he, he acted not only generously financially with his own funds, yeah. but he used all of his connections to, to make that happen. You, and you, now- He wanted to do justice on that film. Exactly. Did, that's why he took the 10 years to get everything together in the right moment. But right. my father, you know, he was older and he was impatient and he just kept calling his office every couple of weeks, you know. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, yes. I'd like to share this w with you. Um, I came from an over 55 community and there was a gentleman there the Holocaust came up or anything Jewish came up, he would start to cry or leave the room. 
And for a long time, I thought he was a survivor or a family survivor. And one day, he confessed the fact that he was a German young boy in Germany at the time of the war, and he was Hitler Youth. And he said it was like being in the Boy Scouts, and he was very proud of it, and his mother made him very proud of it, and kept telling him about German pride and how they have now reclaimed their pride. He said, and I wasn't until I was older, and I learned what Hitler Youth was, and I learned of the Holocaust. I can't bear it. I can't bear it. Yep. Why didn't the Allies bomb the tracks and the roads going into the concentration camps? I'm, I'm sorry. He asked why the Germans, uh, why the uh, Allies didn't bomb the roads and trains that went into the concentration camps. I don't know. I don't think she knows about military intelligence. <laughs> Marie, thank you very, thank very, you very much, much for coming it. and sharing your story much. again. I appreciate it. Really thank fascinating. You. Oh, thank you. It's rare that we get really the story firsthand like this. Um, so thank you again, Marie.